Okay, first of all, a couple of thank yous. Um, thank you to Anne and Claudia for inviting me over to come and talk about the, uh, the mobile phone app today. Um, and also thank you to my many collaborators on this project. As you hear me talk about it, you'll realise that one person couldn't have done all this. Um, and so these folk in these different places have been um, impo very important um, in helping this project come to fruition. A third thank you to you guys for coming out on a cold evening. Um, if I'm talking too fast, just say, Dave, slow down. Okay, and I'll slow down. I get excited. <coughs> okay, so um, we've been systematically collect I haven't, but we have been systematically collecting scientific data on dialect for about 200 years now, just under 200 years. And in that 200 years, we've gone about doing it in very different ways. So back in the 19th century, um, we had a range of very often postal methods for collecting information about dialect. So um, Ellis, who was probably uh, <coughs> Great, Brit Great Britain's first systematic um, dialectologist, um, collected data by sending questionnaires out to teachers and priests around um, Great Britain asking them to transcribe um, the text into the local dialect. Um, and he then received some, but not all, of the questionnaires that he'd sent out, um, checked them. He was lucky enough to have a phonetician who would sometimes go out and check stuff, um, but largely the data was collected through these questionnaires. As we move into the 20th century, we begin to see dialectology moving towards people actually going out and meeting the people that they are interviewing. Um, so in the mid 20th century, um, Britain uh, had what's called the Survey of English Dialects, where a range of linguists went out to three, over 300 villages in Britain and um, systematically went through a large questionnaire face to face with their person from each village, um, asking them questions um, like, what's this? Expecting the answer, paper. And then the person they're sitting opposite would say, paper. And they would then write down in phonetic script how that person had said, paper. Okay. And this would go on for 24 hours. Okay, so the questionnaire in the 1950s took 24 hours obviously spread over several days. Um, this was before the time, really, of systematic recording devices. So many of these interviews were not recorded. They were that the answers were simply transcribed on the spot. And the data were all answers to questions. Um, some of them were like, what's that paper? Or what comes after Monday, <laughs> Tuesday? Those kinds of questions. Um, and those data were then gathered together. Atlases were made of how different parts of England um, pronounced different words, chose different words, used different grammatical structures. And then from the 1960s onwards, we radically changed the way we did dialectology. These traditional approaches largely were focused on the collection of data from old, mostly rural, mostly men. And in the 1960s, um, we have a social linguistic turn in dialectology where other people start to be taken into consideration. <coughs> so social linguistics moves from the countryside to the city, largely. It's largely stayed there. It also took into consideration women. It took into consideration younger people, although it took a while to take children into, into account. Um, it took into consideration people's social backgrounds, as had not been done before. Um, and it took into consideration things like ethnicity. So suddenly, dialectology, from having been focused on old rural men, became interested in social diversity, how different people in the community um, speak their dialect. <coughs> Most of those studies were carried out in individual locations back in, from the 1960s onwards. So somebody would go to New York, or they'd go to Montreal, 
or they'd go to Panama City, or they'd go to Sydney. And they would gather a bunch of people um, and record those people, we have recording devices then, um, so they could then analyse that speech later on, because they'd got the recording, it could be checked. Um, the conversation was fluid rather than one word answers. So we had something more approaching a conversation being recorded rather than answers to one word questions. Um, in fact, informal conversation came to be the kind of focus of this kind of dialectology. So there was a very strong emphasis on getting informal data as relaxed as possible, even though that's hard to get. Um, but nevertheless, it still insisted on <coughs> capturing people who were non-mobile. So even these studies of big cities like Sydney and New York, Montreal, only took into consideration people who'd been born and bred there. So large, large sections of the populations of those cities were then excluded from those surveys. But nevertheless, social linguistic dialectology focused on individual places rather than the previous work which had been looking at geographical distributions of dialect. It had a focus on <coughs> conversation, on informal conversation, and there tended to be a prioritisation of looking for working class speakers rather than middle class or educated speakers on the whole. Now, in the last, I guess, 10 years, the internet has afforded us a whole range of other ways of collecting data. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is one such example of a different way of collecting dialect data, but there are many. Um, some people have collected dialect data through internet surveys, through websites. Um, there is now a very um, uh, interesting development looking at how we can use Twitter to collect dialect data. Um, so in Britain, there's a big project looking for, at the moment, for example, whether people say, I gave it to him, I gave him it, or I gave <coughs> it him. Okay, all three of those are possible in various dialects of Great Britain. Um, and uh, there's a study using Twitter data, of which, of course, there is gazillions of examples, um, looking to, to find regional patterns in the distribution of those three forms. So we have Twitter, we have the internet-based approaches. Um, I'm going to be talking about a smartphone app today. Now the English Dialects app, which is what I'm going to be talking about, um, developed thanks to collaboration with Adrian Lehmann and Marie-José Colli, who had set up the Swiss Dialect app. Um, this was a mobile phone application established in 2002, sorry, 2012, we didn't have smartphones in 2002, um, in 2012, um, to look at regional variation in Swiss German. Um, and any of you who have been to Switzerland and tried to speak German um, will know that the kind of German that we learn in school is not very much use in Switzerland, really, because the whole country has a very ornate <coughs> network of regional dialects, some of which are very different from each other, and which everybody speaks. Yeah? So the app was trying to um, find out about contemporary dialect use in Switzerland and compare it with a more traditional survey um, that uh, had been carried out in the 1950s and 1960s. And Adrian and Marie-José came along to me and said, Dave, let's do one on England. And I said, go away. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 um, we, can, we can do this, it'll be fun, it'll be cool, we'll convince you that this is a good thing to do. And now, three years later, I can admit that, I'm, that I, that I realised it was a good thing to do. Um, as a sociolinguist, I found the idea of collecting data with a mobile phone app very bizarre. And I will tell you, I will come to that later on because I want to talk about methods and about what using mobile phones 
as dialect collecting devices tells us about social linguistic methods. So I was a bit worried, I have to admit. Um, but we did it and um, we launched it in January 2016. And since then, it has been um, downloaded and used in some way um, by more than 85,000 people. And so our results that we get are based on a large number of, speaker, of users. Um, I'll talk about the different parts of the app at the moment. Different, different numbers use different parts of the app. Um, different numbers did more or less parts of the app, but um, we'll talk about that later. The aim of it was partly to tap into people's fascination with dialect and language. And one of the things that we correctly predicted with the app in England was that the media would be very excited about it. Um, and they were. Um, they were, um, at, at various moments in the app's life, they were, um, I was almost in permanently on the radio in various parts of Great Britain, talking about the app, talking about the results of the app, because they found that exciting, and it filled a few minutes before the news <coughs> or the weather on the radio. Um, so there's partly that, but partly we wanted to collect some dialect um, data from users across England and see um, how valid we felt it might be to collect dialect data using um, such methods and also um, evaluate the extent to which crowdsourced dialect data can be collated, analysed and presented in meaningful ways. What can this tell us about dialect distribution um, today um, in Great Britain? So we're going to start off by talking about the development and the functions of the app so that you know what it does. Then I'm going to reflect a bit on a method and then some results so we can see some nice pretty maps. Okay. okay, so the dialect app has two parts, really. Um, there's a recording part and a quiz part. And the recording part presents users with um, a simplified version of the boy who cried wolf story and the idea is that they, people record themselves reading the, that text. So we have different, different people in different parts of, the, of Britain using their, their, their phone, <coughs> pressing the record button and reading what they see on the screen and there are ten sentences for them to read. <coughs> Over 4,000 users, so not huge numbers, um, that we'll see later, but over 4,000 users have uploaded their reading of the 10 sentences, um, and um, these um, little pink blobs are where um, the distribution of the users of the, um, of the reading, the recording part. One of the things we didn't expect, we, we absolutely made it clear that this was about England, and I'll show you why in a moment, um, but we had people from all over the world filling it in. So we had people in Peru. <laughs> so, so we had lots and lots and lots of users, and some of them we had to kind of get rid of in the final analysis because they weren't in the right place. So we, we actually got lots of data in the end, unintentionally, from Scotland and Ireland in ways that we could use. Um, but it's still nevertheless slightly problematic, which I'll mention later on. And users can um, also then listen to other people's recordings of the story. So you can listen to this 38-year-old uh, male and listen to his uh, recording <laughs> of the story. And yours then becomes one of the ones that other people can listen to on there. Yeah. And also, you can also listen to recordings, not of this story, but recordings from the survey of English dialects from the 1950s and 60s, where they made some short recordings of a few minutes of some speakers. So we ha have some snippets of how it used to be um, 50 or 60 years ago. So you can listen to them. The second and most taken up part was the quiz. There were 26 questions, quiz questions, on um, lexis, phonology, morphology and syntax 
Um, and some of them are uh, pronunciation type questions. So the first one here on the left is, in the word butter, um, I pronounce the U as, and then you can listen to somebody, me actually, um, <laughs> saying butter or butter. And you then choose which one you say and you click on it. Okay? And you then see a map which shows you how people in the 1950s pronounced that vowel. Which, which areas said like butter, which area said butter. So if you said butter, it would sh the map would then show you the butter area. The so people like you live, lived here in the 1950s. Okay. Um, second one here, do you pronounce the R in arm? As you can hear, I don't. Um, so you can listen to arm and arm and if you say arm you can click arm and if you say arm you can click arm and you then get shown the area that uses your pronunciation and so it goes on yeah after you've done the 26 questions the app guesses where you're from <laughs> now the guess was based on the survey of English dialects from the 1950s. So we compared people's answers with answers from old rural men in the 1950s and said, if you were an old rural man in the 1950s, <laughs> you'd have come from this place, or this place, or this place, probably. Right? Now, of course, most people who use the app were not old rural men in the 1950s. Um, and so the app was often wrong. We knew it would be wrong. Okay? We guessed it would be wrong. Um, but what people were then asked was to, um, I think this is on the next slide. They were then asked to tell us where they're from, if they're not from where the app guessed they are. Yeah? So then we have these people geolocated. We know where they're from. <coughs> who said butter and arm. Yeah? And all these other 26, um, 20, the other 24 answers. So we can now geolocate this person. We've got their data. Um, we then ask them to fill in some background information about themselves so that we knew how old they were, whether they were male or female, whether they were... Um, highly educated, less educated, so their educational level, how mobile they were, what ethnic group they belonged to, and so on and so forth. So for each of these users, they were asked to fill in this information so that we had some social background information as well as their geographical position. And um, lots of people did that. 50,000 people completed the questionnaire and filled in the social background information. So we have a, a nationwide survey of 26 dialect items from 50,000 people. Bear in mind that the survey of English dialects had 313 people. <coughs> so very, 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 very quickly, we had masses and masses of data. Limited data, but masses of it. Okay. These are the things we asked about. Um, so the usual things like age and gender and ethnicity, but also how far they travel to school or work, because we're interested in kind of everyday mobility, and also how many times they've moved in the past 10 years to get some sense of their residential mobility. In May 2016, so four or five months after the app was launched, we used the results that people have given us to rebase the guess <coughs> that the app gave. So rather than guessing on the basis of the survey of English dialects 50 years ago, the app guessed on the basis of the results that we had in the first five months. Yeah? And then, of course, the app became much better at guessing where people were from because we had contemporary data that the app could use to guess with. The guessing was a bit of fun. <laughs> right? I mean, it made it fun for the users. Um, we were quite surprised at how few people wrote to us and said, this is crap. <laughs> I mean, we had a few who said that. 
A few said, yeah, I was brought up in London, it said I was from Scotland. <laughs> a very few said that. Um, we got lots of emails, though, of people telling us about their life histories. <laughs> After a few months, I began to feel like a therapist. Um, because I was listening to these stories about people saying, well, I was born in London, but then I moved to Chester, and then I moved there, and then I moved there, and then I moved there. And the, and the app tells, told me that I'm from where I live now. Isn't that strange? So we had lots of stories like that. Very few people were upset, which is... Uh, perhaps they just threw it away and didn't to tell us. Okay, so that's the app. That's what it does. Um, and it, of course, gave us all these recordings of people reading. And it gave us 26 answers to questions that reveal dialect variation and social information about the users of those 26 features. Okay. So, I'm going to grumble now about the, me about the method. These are all the things that I said to Adrian and marie Jose when they said, come along and do this app. These are some of the things I said to them. Um, we were not with the people, obviously, when they filled in the quiz. So there wasn't anybody there to hold their hand, to answer any questions they had when they were filling it in. So they could have been messing around, right? They could have been sitting in Newcastle and pretended they were in London. We have, we have no way, really, of coping with that. They could have answered more than once as different people. We have no way of knowing if they did, really. Um, and some people reported that they had such mobile biographies, they didn't know where they were from. Um, and we had a few people who kind of guessed where they were from. Um, I mean, we tried to make the question present as if it was, you know, where were you, you socialised as a child, really? You know, where, where did you get your dialect socialisation as a child? But um, people felt that that was still problematic in some cases. So we still have um, people who perhaps, not intentionally, but um, didn't necessarily place themselves in the place that we would have placed them. We obviously have masses of data, right? 50,000 responses to these questions. So we have big data. <coughs> um, but perhaps big data is bad data. It's, these data are very unlike the sorts of data that sociolinguists would be happy with. Remember, <coughs> I'm a sociolinguist. I'm, I was unhappy with this data <laughs> to start off with. Um, what the typical sociolinguistic data set would be is small samples, perhaps an hour, of carefully chosen speakers from one or very few localities. So usually as a sociolinguist, I would go to one place. right? So Norwich or London or Liverpool. I wouldn't try and cover the whole country. That's not been done since the survey of English dialects. I would have, a, as a sociolinguist, I would tend to favour native speaking, born and bred people from that community, often working class speakers, often who are relatively um, immobile, <coughs> who have stable biographies, who haven't moved around a lot. <coughs> and I'd look for long stretches of informal conversation, not answers to words, not, not answers to questions. Yeah. So I don't have, as a, as a researcher, as I would if I was a sociolinguist, sensitive ethnographic background data about these speakers. All I have is the boxes they ticked, and they might be, they might be lying to me. Right? Um, I, don't, I can't control to get those speakers that a typical sociolinguistic project would look for. The immobile, the... Um, the, the born and bred natives. I can't control for that. Anybody can download the app for free and do it. So I can't control that, those things like I could in a social linguistic survey. <coughs> um, and I can't consider informal speech with this um, or connected speech or look at lots of examples of a single word to see how they're pronounced. I just have one. So there are problems. 
But in social linguistically typically di typical dialect work, we tend to focus on one place, but we have no sense with all of these studies of individual places what the national picture looks like. Because the studies of the individual places were carried out in different ways, at different times, by different people, using different methods. So even given what we have, it's quite hard to put together a map of a country. The study of Norwich, for example, was done in the 1960s, and the study of Glasgow was done in the 2000s, and there's now a study of Manchester going on. So they're not really very comparable, and they're being done by different people, with different methods at different times. We have no nationwide picture. A nationwide picture, the reason, one of the reasons why we don't have one is because it's so expensive to do it. Right? If we were to send field workers out, like they did in the 1950s, going round to hundreds of locations, imagine how much that would cost. So it's just been prohibitively expensive to do a nationwide study um, to replicate what we did in the 1950s. Um, Lebov, who was one of the founding figures, I'm sure many of you know about Lebov's work, um, this, um, this fact that doing a traditional survey of, of a whole um, country was so expensive was one of his motivations for doing the Atlas of North American English on the phone. So people sat in the university and phoned people around the US and gathered data that way because it was then cheaper <coughs> to get um, speakers from different parts of the country. But again, very few speakers from different cities. So Los Angeles is represented by five or six people in the Bob's survey. Um, the app that we developed was quick to produce, quite cheap. I mean, it probably cost in all, with all the developers' costs, about 10,000 euros, which is cheap as far as these surveys are concerned. If we started sending people out, we could add a few noughts onto the end of the 10,000 euros. Um, and it got a lot of data in a short space of time. So I think one of, the, one of the clear advantages of this type of method is that we get a nationwide picture of regional variation quickly, cheaply, and it can then be used as a basis for more sensitive local studies. So we can look at the map and say, oh, they do that there. Let's go to that place and discover, discover a bit more about that particular feature or that particular community. So we get this nationwide picture, roughly, and you'll see it's, we'll see some quite amazing maps in a minute. Um, we get what looks like a pretty good picture of the, of the country at a very cheap price. So in that sense, it's doing something that we've not been able to do for 50 years um, because of the cost as well as practicality. Now, if I ask you um, what the word you use for when you get a little piece of wood under your skin is, this is a very regional, this is a very regionally variable word in England. If I ask you what word you use and you tell me, what you're actually doing is having an intuition about what word you use. Not, not actually giving me what word you use. Right? You're thinking about it and thinking about which word you use and telling me. You may be wrong. <laughs> um, Lebov, in, in a fantastic paper which I recommend all my students read from 1996, demonstrates that our intuitions about our language use are often wrong often badly wrong. Um, the, I'll give you one example of how badly wrong they are because it's a beautiful example. Um, he asked a group of students in an undergraduate class what the last thing they say in a conversation to a friend is when they leave them. Okay, so you've been talking to a friend and you leave each other. What's the last thing you say? So the vast majority of the students in the room thought they said, see ya or see you later. Okay? Something like 75-80% claimed to use see you or see you later. He then did observations of how those, what those students actually did. 10% of 
actually said see you later. 80% said bye bye. <laughs> Hardly anybody claimed to say bye bye. Now, come on, think about it. This, you say this every day. You say it every day, many times, and you don't know what you do. Right? That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So, the Bob's point here is that we have to be very careful when we're collecting data on language variation um, to, to be wary of people's intuitions, what they think they say, as opposed to what they actually say. Now, in this quiz, what we're asking them to do is to, is to tell us what they think they say and not what they actually say. Now, we do have the recordings, of course, um, and I had a student who compared people's use in the recording and their claims in the quiz. And what, they, what she found was that generally people are fairly accurate, but they're not very accurate with diphthongs. So the diphthong data I'm not going to talk about because it's a little bit, a little bit strange. People, people claim to use one thing and then in the recording use something completely different uh, in, that, in that data. So it's, it's, that's, we have to be careful of that. But, but Lebov has a point here. Here we are asking for intuitions rather than actual language use. We have to be careful of that. Another valid objection is that the sample collected by the app is skewed. Now remember, the sample collected by traditional dialectologists was also skewed. Old rural men, non-mobile old rural men. The data collected by modern sociolinguists is also actually a bit skewed because children were largely avoided and again um, mobile people were largely um, avoided and very often the people who were collected in these places were people who were um, contacts who were known through networks by the researcher so we can't just say oh the sample skewed pretending that previous approaches were not skewed. They were too. Right? So we have to bear that in mind. But let's look at the sample. Here we have the geographical distribution of the sample. Actually, this is pretty good. The, the geographical distribution of our sample and the national population is pretty, pretty um, uh, good. The only places where there, where there is a, a skew in the geographical distribution tends to be in rural areas where we did radio interviews. So we have rather too many people here, Shropshire, because I had a very, very long interview on Radio Shropshire and a phone-in at, um, at, at 5 o'clock in the evening on Radio Shropshire. And we suddenly got masses of data from Shropshire. Um, so there are some rural areas that are overrepresented in our in our map, we think because of that. But generally, it's a pretty good picture. Gender, bias towards females. Um, that is, despite the fact there are more women in Britain than men, um, this, is, this is biased, um, to, uh, still biased towards women. So slightly too female. Very educated, the sample. As you might imagine with smartphone use. Um, so, 58% of our users had some kind of higher education qualification, like a bachelor's degree. Whereas the, the, the figure for the population as a whole is 22%. So, way, 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 way too educated, this sample. Now, that's partly, of course, to, because the sample is going to be younger. Um, it's going to be skewed towards younger people, as we'll see in a moment. And younger people tend to have, are more likely to have a higher education qualification than older people are. <coughs> people without formal um, qualifications are massively underrepresented. So we only had 2% of our users from the group of people without formal qualifications. 18% of the population <coughs> fall into that group. Ethnicity, the sample is mildly over, or mildly too white British, but not very. Here's our age picture. Not unexpectedly, 
Um, so this is a, this is a, um, uh, our our sample. Sorry, our sample top. The, the country is the bottom. Um, so we are missing children from our sample because many children, younger children, don't have smartphones. Although I'm increasingly <coughs> surprised at how many do. Um, our average, our mean age was 25, whereas the mean age in the UK is 39. So it's a very young sample in comparison to the population as a whole. Um, speakers who have moved in the past 10 years, so four times or more, 21%, um, I still live in the same house, 27%. This is actually very reflective of the population as a whole. Um, one in nine people in the UK move every year. And that's been like that for 20 years. Um, I'd be interested to know what it's like here, actually. <coughs> you know, it's probably, probably data collected like that, but one in nine, imagine, one in nine of the population moving every year, that's a huge population churn, right? So the fact that there are lots of people who have moved at least once, twice, um, more <coughs> in 10 years is not surprising. So compared with the population of England as a whole, the sample is much more highly educated, much more young adulty, slightly more female, similarly geographically distributed, similarly mobile. But the good thing about the app is that we can cope with this because we have um, social background data from the speakers. So we can, we can take out all of our old rural men or our old uneducated men and look at, that, look at them. We can take all of our young, highly educated women and look at them. We can take out all of our um, non-British white people and look at them. We can actually focus on different sections of the <coughs> population if we want to because we have the social background data. So whilst the, the sample is skewed, we can <coughs> play with that given the way that we have um, collected the data. And it's more balanced than most other nationwide surveys of England um, that have been carried out. <coughs> There were advantages of hands-off sampling. We could not, we had no control over who used the app at all, right? So we had people in Peru do. Um, Lebov um, was quite adamant that we should do more of this. We should do more random or hands-off sampling. So he said an accurate view of a community cannot be obtained by the study of a few individuals or of small groups nor even of extended social networks of 30 or 40 individuals. This is a really cutting comment, because so much of sociolinguistics has done exactly that. Has grabbed 30 or 40 people from a place and done that, looked at them. Most importantly, it cannot be obtained by any approach that begins with the personal connections of the investigators. Many sociolinguists have done that. In fact, in sociolinguistic methods classes, we often tell people to go out and start off with friends of friends and then get those friends of friends to pass you on to more friends. Lobov is criticising that approach. A truly representative sample must be based on a random sample. Unfortunately, a number of social linguistic studies have retreated from this standard. Oof, they have indeed. In many studies, any individual who would agree to be interviewed was selected as long as, as, long as he or she had the right social characteristics. Other studies have been confined to friends and relatives and acquaintances of the investigators, Unless they're accompanied by a wider random sample, they will not produce a clear view of the structure of the speech community as a whole. We must therefore recognise a fundamental conflict <coughs> centred about the choice, choice of field methods. So the Bob here is saying, all of this social linguistic work, which has basically gone out into local communities and grabbed a few friends and their friends, is fundamentally flawed because the sample's not random. We should be random sampling, he says, from a community and not just grabbing people who are easy to persuade or near to us or close to us or friendly to us. So he says that random sampling remains the best way of ensuring that the speech recorded is not biased towards the social background of the researcher. Now, of course, although the app is not a random sampler, the sampling is completely out of our control. Right? So we could not choose our mates 
as sometimes happens in social linguistic research, it must be said. We cannot exclude the mobile, as we discovered with all the emails that we had. And we can't exclude that person at the end of the street who never says hello. Right? Who we would probably avoid because he or she would be too difficult to persuade to take part. We, can't, we, we cannot exclude those people, rightly. So actually then, thinking about some of these methodological problems, I, I became persuaded that we could, we could use this data with caution, given all the intuition problems, um, to get a regional picture, a nationwide picture of regional variation um, in uh, England, in British English. Um, so what we... I'm now going to show you some results. Um, we were able to compare our results with the results of the survey of English dialects to give an idea of how things have changed over time, which is quite nice. We can see language change in progress. Um, we were able to analyse um, our results according to things like age, so compare old speakers and young speakers in the app. <coughs> um, Tam Blackster, who's based at Cambridge, has produced our lovely maps that you'll see highlighting the use of the different features. Um, and I would like to argue that the comparisons between the survey of English dialects and the app present a best and worst case scenario for traditional dialect respectively. So the survey of English dialects, looking as it does only at old, rural, non-mobile men, probably overestimates the amount of traditional dialects that were spoken in England in the 1950s because that's the group in the society who's most likely to speak it then. And our sample of young, highly educated, um, uh, mobile women um, is probably the, the worst case scenario for dialect um, because it's um, been adopted, been used most by those least likely in British society to speak a non-standard dialect, actually. Yeah? So the pictures we see are probably um, as bad as it gets uh, for, the local for, the, for local dialect and non-standard dialect um, at the moment, for some of the features. So um, I'm going to look at the um, results looking at things like dialect levelling and the retention of traditional dialect. Uh, look at innovation diffusion, how new features have spread, the effects of mobility, um, we'll look at roticity, so the um, arm um, variation. And finally, a tasty treat at the end, which um, for British people is very important. But to start off with, some basics. Um, if you're from the north of England, there are, there are two linguistic features that are often used um, to signal your northernness. Um, one of them is the use of the o uh vowel in words like butter, so butter instead of butter. Um, and, uh, and so this was obviously one of the features that we wanted to look at in the app. So generally, people in the north would say butter, people in the south would say butter. Um, the southern form is actually an innovation um, from three or four hundred years ago. So here we have the picture from the Survey of English Dialects from the 1950s. The blue area is the butter area, and the red area is the butter area. Okay? And here we have our results. Now, remember, the survey of English dialects didn't look at Ireland and Scotland, right? So we have no idea what they did in the 1950s, what we do, but we have no data from it. So ignore Scotland and Ireland for now. You can see the blue area. Has, got, has moved northwards, right? And the red area is less red. <laughs> yeah? So, so you've got a moving of the, of the butter area northwards, but you've also got more and more northerners saying butter. Now, we know from, from our analysis of this data that those northerners who are using butter are much more likely to be highly educated and younger. Mm. Okay. So there's the comparison of the two. Remember the 1950s data is only old rural men, whereas the, the 2016 data is everyone. 
Yeah? So probably if we looked at everyone in the 1950s, we would have seen blue patches in the red area, even then. Even more important than saying butter for butter is saying last for last. Okay, this one is very important indeed um, as part of Northern English identity. John Wells back in 1982 said, there are many educated Northerners who would not be caught dead doing something so vulgar as to pronounce um, butter, strut words with or, but who would feel it to be a denial of their identity as Northerners to say bath words like last with anything other than short ah. So what Errol Wells is saying is that the butter vowel is important but um, lots of educated northerners wouldn't use it but to say last as a northerner is to completely um, deny your identity as a northerner so northerners would say last and it's very important as part of northern identity to say last okay so let's see what happens here we have the survey of english dialects you can see the green area is the last area the yellow area is the last area what do you think is going to happen? The same as the last one? Nah. The opposite, in fact. The yellow area is actually moving southwards. So, remember, this is everybody. The last one was just old men. We can zoom in a bit. So there's the comparison. You can see how that the yellow area is more south in the, in the 2016 data and we can zoom in to the area here, so this area of the Midlands, of Burning and Wolverhampton and Coventry which was um, largely our last using before is now variable but much more last using so it's the Midlands that are becoming northern this was a surprise Yes, it was a surprise. <laughs> ha having said that, we, there have been a number of small studies which have said, it looks like the, the northern form is moving southwards. <coughs> Very small studies from individual locations where they found young people using the northern form more than old people in the same community. So it's, although it was a surprise to actually see it so clearly marked in these maps, there had been other people who suggested that might be one thing that was happening. But we have some nice evidence now. Okay, so now some examples of dialect levelling. Mm. So getting a little piece of wood under your skin is a, is a highly, was a highly regional um, uh, thing in England. So here we have the picture from the 1950s where in the southeast and the southwest you have the the word splinter, which I suspect is the word that you've learnt if you've learnt it in English, um, and the north and the east has something else. But there's a whole range of different words um, that you could use, like shiver, sliver, spiel, spelk, spell, spile, spill, splint, spool. Mm. So these were the majority forms in these areas in the 1950s. And this one is the majority forms in the 2016 data. So, the majority form. Right? That doesn't mean to say that all the variations disappeared. So this is the majority form. So only in the northeast, only in Newcastle, does the word spelk outperform splinter. Okay? So Newcastle, Sunderland, and that part of the northeast of England retains the traditional dialect feature. And for many of the maps, for many of the questions that we had in the quiz, we find the northeast continuing to do northeast things, <laughs> um, which was kind of reassuring. Okay, now when we start looking at individual words, we can see that they're still there; they're just not the majority anymore. <coughs> So this is the word spell, and here you can see the blue area is the word spell in the 1950s, and the blue area is the word spell 
um, in 2016. And you can see that actually the area that's covered by some bluishness is actually still fairly similar. It's just people are, fewer people are using it. Notice also this little bit of blue here in Cumbria matches the little blue over there. So a little island of, of uh, spell use um, detached from the main area. So this area is shrinking, but it's still, it's still being used to a certain extent, mostly by older people. Here we have, we go to the east of England, the 1950s um, word shiver being used in Norfolk, the grey area, and you can see how it's retreated <coughs> to eastern um, Norfolk in the 2016 data. But the, 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 the dark, the dark grey on this map is 15%. So 15% of users in that grey area use um, Shiver. So not many, but it's still holding on. And the one to the south in Suffolk, that's the sliver area, the orange area, and again it's shifting to the east. And this is the orange area is 9% shiver use, so it's not very much at all clinging on, um, but it's still there a little bit, it hasn't completely disappeared. Because we have data from old people and young people, and we asked them how old they were, we can compare old people in the app and young people in the app, and that helps us sometimes examine change over time by comparing old, middle-aged and young. So here we have our shiver, our piece of wood under the skin in um, the east of England again. We've got the over 50s, where, most, where there's most grey, 30s, 20, uh, 30s to 50s, 20s to 30s, and then the 30s. So you can see over time, as the speakers get younger, the use of this dialect feature has virtually gone. So here, there's very, very, very little um, use of the um, traditional feature at all. Whereas amongst the older speakers, there's still 20-30% use of the traditional feature. So we can play with the data in these ways to show how different age groups use different features. And by the looks of this, Shiver um, is not actually going to be used for very much longer. I'm actually a Shiver user because I come from there, and I also fall into the oldest age category now. <laughs> So more examples, this is a dramatic example of dialect levelling. And that's the pronunciation of off as off. So before um, voiceless fricatives, um, off can sometimes be pronounced off. So um, my mum, for example, would say uh, off, and she would say Australia as well, um, and orphan rather than often. Uh, so in... The Serbo English dialect, this whole yellow area said off rather than off. Quite a big area of the country, right? That says off. And the orange area says off. It's gone. It's virtually gone. You can see some little patches. This is where I'm from. There's a little patch of yellow there. So my mum is in the right place. Um, but basically, this feature has disappeared, yeah. virtually. Um, you know, the, the levels of, um, of off use here are, even the yellowest patches are 10% off. So a feature that in the 1950s embraced the whole of the south of England has now virtually disappeared. That's dialect levelling. With variation, we still have variation in British English between um, himself and his self. Um, so he uh, cut his self rather than he cut himself. Yeah. Very, very, very common in the Serb English dialects. The red area is the his self area. Very common. Um, now it's virtually disappeared. So the, the kind of um, yellowy areas 
are the areas that retain um, <coughs> the self, and still only 30 to 40 percent. So we have little patches in these towns here, up in Newcastle, but, event, but basically the country has dumped his self for himself um, in this um, in this survey. I wonder whether actually people are under-reporting his self in this. I use his self. And one of the things that we're trying to look at in the data is whether the grammatical features seem to be um, claimed as more standard than the some of the phonological features do. Because that, to me, is... Um, very dramatic and more dramatic than I hear um, but that's a question for us to play with with the stats um, but you can see I mean even if even if it does over represent the amount of himself there has still been a, a massive um, dialect leveling um, between the 1950s and, and today So, so far we've seen some terrible stories of dialect loss, right? traditional dialect features being wiped away. We have some examples of traditional dialect being retained relatively well. So the first one is the use of ng in place of ng in stressed syllables. So in some parts of the country, instead of saying sing, people say sing, singing, okay? instead of singing. So the word we had in, the, in, our, in our app was the word tongue. So uh, tongue, 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 tongue. Um, here we have the 1950s. You can see this orange area. And you can see the orange area here um, in 2016 is kind of in the right place, um, but uh, not quite so dark, not quite so bright orange yet. Yeah? <coughs> So when you compare that with that first impression, is, oh, it's going, right? I mean, it probably is, to a certain extent. But remember, this is just old rural men, and this is everybody. Um, and the orange areas that you do see are still 70, 80% of that ung <coughs> pronunciation. This confirms the, um, what we found in a number of studies in this area that looked at individual places that have found that young people are using ng just as much as old people in individual communities. <laughs> so the maps don't necessarily show it very well because they're not comparing like with like, right? They're comparing these old rural men with everybody. But actually this feature, judging by these maps, is not doing too badly in comparison with some other features. we can see um, new features spreading sometimes. One of the, uh, the very um, salient new features spreading in British English is the use of f instead of th, so free instead of three. Um, and we have the, 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 the word um, three in the app. Um, it has been claimed to be a rapidly spreading innovation from London and the South East. And here we have the survey English dialect data from the 1950s, where it was found in, in around London and in Suffolk. Um, and you can see now that the whole country is covered by a thin layer of, or of, sort of orangeness, redness. So the feature was actually spread right across the country, not to very, very high levels. I mean, the darkest red here is only 45, 50%. It's still very much a, a younger person's feature, particularly beyond London. But it is way beyond the South London and the South East um, in comparison with what was happening in the 1950s. Another feature is this pronunciation of R, so the arm versus arm pronunciation. In the 1950s, the arm <coughs> pronunciation was used in large parts of the southwest, a little part of Lancashire and up in the northeast. 
now it's virtually gone. So this is the area that was traditionally our own <coughs> sleeping, and whilst there are still, I mean, if you take those areas, about 30% are of users, it's much less than it was in the 1950s. I think we've got, we can zoom in. Yep. Um, so you can see just how dramatic the difference is between the 1950s when all of the old rural men said arm, and now when the population as a whole is barely using it. But actually the place with most arm is Bristol. By far the biggest urban centre in that area. Now we're used to thinking, we're used to finding, that the traditional dialect is safest in, rur in deep rural areas and disappears quickest in cities. Here we've got the complete reverse. It seems to be surviving in Bristol much better than, than it's surviving in the rural areas. Now this could be something to do with the demographics of this part of the country. What's happened to the southwest in the last 50 or 60 years is that lots and lots of people from the southeast of England have moved to the southwest, bringing their their arm pronunciations rather than their, um, with them, buying homes in that part of um, the southwest. House prices have gone up very, very rapidly. Young people can barely afford to live in those rural areas anymore because all of the houses have been bought up by Londoners and people from the southeast. So they move to the city where there is accommodation where they can, where they can afford. So there's been a lot of rural outmigration of locals from the southwest to Bristol and a lot of in-migration to the southwest from <coughs> Londoners, to the extent that people are getting really, frankly, pissed off with the fact that so many of the houses in the southwest are un unoccupied for large parts of the year because they're owned by Londoners. So there's been massive counter-urbanisation, sh population shifts from the city to the countryside that have dramatically affected the rural southwest. Um, and... Bristol is a, a kind of a haven of southwesternness still, because it hasn't been affected by that so much. But that's one potential demographic explanation as to why the rural areas of, of the southwest have been so dramatically affected by um, this dialect loss. Okay, finally, if you're British, this is very important. Okay, this is very important. Even more important than that is the way you say that word. So even if you don't eat it, you will have very strong views on how it should be pronounced. Okay? It's probably the pronunciation, salient pronunciation shibboleth in the country. For me, this can be nothing other than a scone. Okay? There are other people who can only possibly say scone. Now what tends to happen is that if you're a scone user, you think that scone use is a posh. <laughs> if you're a scone user, you think that scone users are posh. <laughs> okay. So there are very strong, very strong stereotypes about how that cake is pronounced. Not, I mean, lots of people still eat them, but more people talk about how to say them. Say them. Okay. So one of the things we, th we threw into the, into the app was, do you say scone or scone? Because we have, although it's such a salient feature, this pronunciation feature, we don't know how it's pronounced around the country. We have no idea of the geographical distribution of scone, scone. Thank goodness we did put it into the app because the media loved it. <laughs> This was the one thing they wanted to talk about first of all. So dialect levelling, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, spread of London features, yeah. Let's talk about scone and stuff. Okay? So we had massive publicity for the app because of that. Um, it, our map of scone scone has now been stolen and is circulating around the world, world wide web, being attributed to all sorts of different people. Um, but it was the map that Tam made in Cambridge a couple of years ago. But anyway, that's, uh, that's success for you, I suppose. Okay, so this is what we found for Scone and Scone. So the Oranger 
the area, the more likely you're going to say scone. And the bluer the area, the more likely you're going to say scone. Okay? So, interesting things to note. Scotland <coughs> is a scone area. Right? Um, Northern Ireland is a scone area. The Republic of Ireland is a scone area. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. <laughs> Brexit's bad enough with, without that getting in the way. Um, and then you have these blue areas in and around London. So in East London and South Essex, you have a blue area. So my colleague Sue Fox is from that area, and we had this <coughs> argument. I said, you can't possibly say scone. You're from the south of England. I said, no, 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 I say scone. Well, anyway, her part of, of the southeast of England is indeed scone using. Um, I'm from uh, here, so a mixed area. Um, and you see these blue areas in the, in the south of the north, if you like, which are very strongly um, uh, scone areas. So this is the first nationwide map we have ever had on how this thing is pronounced. And this, this map went global. <laughs> I mean, I kid you not, it was everywhere really suddenly. We've got loads of in radio interviews because of it. Um, we see it everywhere now, not attributed to us anymore. Um, and, and I think it really, really helped get publicity for the app in the first place. So we now know something about this. One thing I didn't realise until I started looking was just how much people talk about this. If you go to Twitter <laughs> and, you, and you search for pronunciation of scone, there are <coughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of people tweeting about this. <laughs> regardless of the app, regardless of the app, it's just something we talk about. So, we were right, in a way, to include this feature, partly because we've learned something we didn't know, but partly because it got people interested in the app, got them doing the other 25, <coughs> frankly, more serious questions, um, uh, and finding out more about how other features varied across the country. So that's SCON. <laughs> There's the regional pattern. So we have the, the North, so Stoke-on-Trent, um, and places like um, uh, Sheffield being strongly scone areas and, and Hull. And there's London. Okay, so to conclude. The English Dialects app then presents, we would like to argue, an initial attempt at deploying new technologies <coughs> and crowdsourcing techniques to tackle um, uh, some of the need to capture um, a survey of the dialect <coughs> landscape. It is not without problems. We, re we recognise these problems. Um, I was completely convinced at the start that it would be a disaster. Um, and they could persuaded me gradually otherwise and I became more or less persuaded. But no method is actually unproblematic or applicable in all scenarios. Um, we believe that the app can, in some circumstances, contribute alongside other techniques to a better understanding of the patterning of language variation um, and the progress of linguistic change. I think the maps that we've shown and we've, and we've compared with the survey of English dialects seem plausible in comparison with those survey of English dialects maps and they're plausible in the context of other more sociolinguistic work which has looked at some of those individual features. And the beautiful advantage of it <coughs> is that it's quick, it's cheap and it's a bit of fun. And the bit of fun, I think, helped to make sure that it was a success. Thank you very much. So thank you for a very interesting presentation. I was wondering about the, you said in the beginning that there was, uh, or there had been an investigation on the diagnostic with GIMP uh, and the reducing Twitter data. And so how, so I'm not a Twitter user, so how, so how do they map uh, regional areas with Twitter users? By looking at the IP addresses or something or? or I'm not a Twitter user either, but, <laughs> but from what I have heard, um, they, they uh, are able to, for, for those Twitter users who geolocate themselves, they then only gather data from them okay. or, or, or scrape the data from them. 
And so they've got a place that they can match with, with, the, with the use, and then they hunt for structures. So I think that's the way they did it, yeah. And, but the, interestingly, their maps, we, we also have that same feature in the app, and their map is almost exactly the same as ours, which is kind of reassuring. Yeah. Um, I was interested, interested in what you said about the spread of the trap fowl in the south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could anything to do with um, the spread of North American English through the media, or is that unlikely? Um, I think that would be unlikely, partly because the quality of the trap fowl in the north is different from the North American trap fowl. Um, But why it's but why it's moved south, I don't know. I, um, there, there's been quite a lot of interesting socio-geographical work, which has looked at um, <coughs> things like uh, regional identity and socio-economic well-being and de deprivation, and they have um, argued that the Midlands um, ha has suffered economically in the last 30, 40 years for various reasons, and that. Um, there is a certain degree of Midlanders feeling themselves northern rather than feeling themselves southern or feeling themselves as Midlanders. Um, so, because in a sense, part of the northern <coughs> identity is that you are not from London, you are not from the south, you are not one of those posh people who live in London. Because if you were a northerner, everybody in London is posh. <coughs> everybody in the south of England is posh. So, so there is a certain sense in which the, the northern identity embraces a whole host of stereotypes about the south, which I think perhaps also people in the Midlands are also beginning to join a lot, go along with, perhaps. Um, also, if you are trying to learn which words have the trap vowel and which words have the bath vowel, it's actually quite hard. <laughs> You've got to learn which, which vowels goes into which word, so you would expect features like that to move in that direction, actually. It's much simpler to have one vowel in those two sets of words rather than two. So there are good linguistic motivations for it to move southwards, but that doesn't explain why the butter butter one, the butter one in the north is. But, uh, yeah, the, so the social explanations for these are sometimes quite hard, I would say. But I think we would need to look at, at um, the social identities of people in the Midlands to see how they are changing and what their attitudes towards their their regional identity are. Possibly to explain it. I don't think it's going to do North America. We looked we looked actually for North Americanisms because some people had reported that British people were starting to use the word fall again for autumn. Um, <coughs> fall is a traditional dialect word for England. So it's actually ours, not the Americans. <laughs> we, ex we, we we lent it to them. Um, and, and some people had said that we were starting to, to pull it back. We looked at fall, hardly anybody used fall anywhere. So there was, there was not much evidence of Americanization in the features we looked for. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was wondering how you formulated the questions. <coughs> Sorry, where they have to read a phrase or where they have to record it? Because if you ask people to read something in their dialect, they could, I think, do two things. They can map the sounds of their own dialect to the standard English, or they could just translate lexical variants and, and synthetic items. How do you make it? Yeah, so we, we were not expecting them to, uh, to translate uh, lexical items and, and grammatical stuff. We were just expecting them to read it. Um, so they were, they were just told to read the text. In their, it, it, um, in the, uh, <coughs> as if they were reading it to a friend or family member. Mm -hmm. So we wanted them to read it in a relaxed way, that's what we told them to do. So the only expectations we had were to potentially get some idea of their phonology. But of course, like you say, reading tends to get a more standard pronunciation. That was a problem we were aware of. Yeah. Um, it be, the part of the problem was we could have got people to just record a conversation and upload it. But then analysing it, if we had 50,000 of them, it would have been really hard. Mm -hmm. At least with the same text, we can then mass analyse it, analyze it using force alignment methods, mm -hmm. um, which means that some people have been already spitting through all these 4,000 recordings and working out things like the intonation patterns and 
there's 10 homes in different regional parts of the country. But yeah, we can only really, they're not, they're not ideal as recordings. So for the lexical items, you use the For the lexical, for, 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 for all of those maps, mm -hmm. we just use the quiz. Okay. Yeah. And we're, we're analyzing the recordings in a different way. So um, with the data from the app, um, you can plot um, the levelling or spread of traditional dialect features. Could, was it, or did you look for, or can you say anything about the emergence of, so particularly perhaps lexically or morphologically then? So I don't know, in an urban centre such as London, the emergence of new dialects in a sense, so um, where you have speakers from different areas, so new forms that are maybe common now in, in the southeast, were there any new forms introduced or was it based on primarily on traditional dialect features? Um, we, we had a mixture of <coughs> features that we thought were just regionally variable, like last last, mm -hmm. features that we, we felt were probably dying out, like the splinter one, and new features like the free three. Um, but obviously we had to decide what those dialect features were in advance. And we also only chose features that were also represented in the survey of English dialects because we wanted them to make a comparison. <coughs> um, I think the method could be used to do those things that you suggest, but like to look at um, different lexical items, emerging lexical items, emerging pronunciations. We could use the same method but you then need a new program to do that. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that we also realised was that we had to give people all of the options um, so that they could tick one of them. And some of the Scottish users complained that their option wasn't in the list. <laughs> and we had to write to them and say, sorry guys, it's not really for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a survey of England because we've only got English data to compare it with. <coughs> so a few people complained that the Scottish word for splinter was not there. Um, so the, tr the trouble with those kinds of techniques that it, um, having all of the options already listed makes them easily mappable. Um, but you then potentially lose some potential new lexical items that people would use for those things. So you need, I mean, I think you could use an app, but you just have to program it a different way. Yeah. More questions? Okay, I wanted to ask, can you control for if the people were, before they were doing the quiz, um, doing the records or listening to the records and to which records they were listening to? So maybe if, uh, if one person was doing the quiz, was listening to a certain kind of records before, to a certain amount of records before, maybe it falsified his answers. In the so I mean, for, probably for Scott, he knows what he said, uh, what, he, what he would say, but maybe you have um, other questions where it's not that clear, and maybe it got influenced by the recordings. Okay, we, we can tell who did both the recording and the quiz, but that's all. So we don't know what they listen to, if they listen to anything. Generally, people did the quiz first because it was more fun. And then many people just stopped there and didn't do the recording. So we, so we can tell from the data upload <coughs> times that most people did, who did the recordings did them second rather than first. So in that sense, they probably weren't influenced by the recordings. Um, if, they, <coughs> if they listened to recordings after they after they've done their own recordings, or just before they did their own recordings, but after the quiz, which is what appears to have happened, they, they what shouldn't have had that effect. But we don't know. Basically. They could have listened to a recording, then done a quiz, then done their own recording. That's possible. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think we have at this point. Thanks uh, a lot. I, could, I would like to make a short observation, though, if I may, because uh, dialect. Uh, are typically perceived as kind of frozen language history, and it looks like with all the young, highly educated women, we get kind of glimpsed of the linguistic future 